exams are graded and ready, and you can pick them up in the biochem office. I don't have them. They're in the biochem office, so I, I can't give them to you. Uh, there's a key posted outside of my office. Um, I've had at least one person say, hey, my score was added up wrong, or I had some question about how this was graded, et cetera, et cetera. So certainly, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer questions for you. Uh, my policy is, if you think something was graded wrong, or something was added wrong, in other words, if there's anything wrong in your exam, the way to deal with it is to write up exactly what's wrong. Okay? So I won't, I mean, I'll talk to you, but I won't, I'm an absent-minded professor. You guys have already seen this. I'm not going to remember what's wrong. All right? So you've got to write up what's wrong, why you think it was worth more points, et cetera, et cetera, and then staple that to your exam and give that to me, if you feel that. Okay? Now, I don't like frivolous inquiries, okay? So people fish for points and so forth. Uh, if there's something that's wrong, I'm certainly happy to address that. Or something that you think wasn't right with that, then of course let me know. All right? And, but that's the procedure for getting something regraded. Does that make sense? Okay. So make sure you go through, and I'm, I'm always surprised the number of people that don't pick up their exams. Okay? If you don't pick up your exam, then you won't know, right? You have basically four school days to pick up your exam. After four school days, I won't make changes. So let's say you're one of those people that didn't pick up your exam and it was misadded by 20 points. Guess what's going to happen when you come in a week from now and say, hey, Kevin, my exam was misgraded? Kevin's going to say, you have four school days to get that done. OK? So the time to get it done is now. Make sure you pick up your exams and look through them. Make sure everything is OK. OK? Um, I haven't yet posted a grade distribution. I will do that this weekend. I just got the grades uh, actually recorded earlier today. Um, it's a little unusual distribution, as I mentioned to a couple of you. Um, a, lot, a decent number up high and a decent number down low. And there's not nearly as many in the middle as I, as I was looking at them going through. So I was a little uh, surprised um, at that. So hopefully uh, we'll see how it plays out. The average on the exam was 63. The high was 99. And the low was in the teens. I can't remember exactly what the low was, but the low was in the teens. So it's a pretty wide distribution. So if you're having questions or concerns, of course, uh, as always, let me know. And I'm always happy to talk to you about your grades. OK, well, let's get through this material. Um, I've got some things uh, to talk about today. Yep. Oh, come on. There we go. And uh, last time I finished talking about blue-white screening, and you saw some complexity to the blue-white screening. But I hope what you saw in that blue-white screening, that it's a very powerful tool to help us identify which cells have a plasmid and which cells have a plasma that has an insert. Those two things are really uh, very useful because it saves me a lot of time instead of having to screen hundreds of bacteria to find the one that is the one that I want. OK. Well, uh, what I want to turn our attention to now is to say a little bit about genetic engineering, uh, which, and I keep talking about DNA, and I'm going to talk even more about uh, DNA here, uh, about uh, how we can use some tools um, of um, uh, DNA, and also I'll talk about some of these with protein as well, to help us get things that we need. All right. Well, I've already talked about taking a human gene, all right, taking a human gene and putting it into a bacterium. I said that you would put this into a vector, and that vector would have a replication origin. It would have an antibiotic resistant resistance gene. It would have a promoter. And we have a place to put the gene in. Okay? So we have all of these things. And if I did that into a bacterium, I took a human gene and I put it into a bacterium, then I can have that bacterium synthesize that human gene because the genetic code for bacteria is the same as it is for us. All right? So they'd have the same information. They would make that protein. So this schematic is showing that uh, a little bit. It's actually simplifying some things because remember, as I showed you, this is showing it for insulin. For insulin, we had to have some proteolytic cleavage to, to break those uh, bonds to uh, make that one chain into basically two chains. Um, if we were to do that in bacteria, we would also have to provide the bacterium with the enzymes that would make those cuts. But we could do that, and people um, and companies uh, do that as a way of making uh, insulin. So that's possible to do. Another thing we would like to be able to do, I always like to say that biochemists are lazy. 
Okay? Biochemists are lazy. All right? I'm a biochemist, so I can say that. We like to find easy ways to do things. And one of the easy way, one of the things that we have to do a lot of in a laboratory is we have to purify a protein. Okay? I want to make a bacterium to make a ton of protein, and that I can do very easily. But all I want to get out of that bacterium is this one protein. The problem is bacteria make several thousand proteins at the same time. So when it's making my protein, it's making a bunch of other proteins. And so if I take this bacterium and then I take all the proteins that it made, some of those are going to be my protein, but most of them are going to be the junk that the bacterium is making that I don't want. Okay? So I want to have a simple and easy way to isolate my protein from all the bacterial proteins. And that's what I'm getting ready to show you. And this is a very cool and simple technique. It's called histidine tagging. This figure I drew myself. I hope you guys like this. I feel kind of proud of that. All right. All right. So what did I do? Well, I had the, the, the region of DNA that coded for this gene. I put it into a vector. And this vector had everything that I told you before, but it also had one other little tiny piece of sequence that was very useful for me. The tiny piece of sequence that it had encoded about six or seven histidine amino acids in a row. Okay? About six or seven histidine amino acids in a row. If I take my gene and I put it into this this vector that has this, what's going to happen is it's going to synthesize my gene. And attached to my gene is going to be this sequence of six or seven histidines. Can you picture that? So I got my gene. And right at the very end of it, there's six or seven histidines. It could be at the beginning. It could be at the end. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Well, why do I do that? The reason I do that is it turns out that histidine when you have them in a sequence like that, will bind to a column that has nickel on it. The histidines will actually grab physically a hold of the nickel. OK? Well, I've just made something that doesn't normally appear in a cell. Cells don't have proteins that have a variety of histidines in a row normally. Okay. I've said that the histidines in a row will be on my protein. And you can see them here in this little red thing, this little red dot on the end of each one of these. My protein is this green guy that's got the red dot. And the red dot are those histidines on the end of it. The bacterial proteins are over here in black. And to give you an idea, there's going to be thousands of them. I've only shown a few because I didn't have enough uh, space in the cell. But there's going to be thousands of these blue guys. And there's going to be a few of the proteins that I want. Well, I can take these cells, I can bust them open. And when I bust them open, I can pour them on top of a column that contains ions of nickel. And that's what this guy is right here. I poured it on top of that. And so what's going to happen? Well, what you're going to see happen is that wherever there's those little red guys, as you can see here, those little red guys are going to stick to the nickel in the column. And the proteins that don't have the histidines, which is all the rest of the cellular proteins, are going to come shooting through. Voila. Now my, my, my protein is on the column. The proteins that I, want, that I don't want have just come through. I've separated my proteins from the rest of the cellular proteins. Very, very simple technique. Okay. How do I get my proteins off of the column? Well, it turns out it's very simple. I simply add ions of nickel. The column has nickel attached, which is why the proteins stick. When I add ions of nickel, the proteins let go of the column. They grab the ions, and they come shooting through. So now I've got my protein. You might say, oh, well, but it's my protein, but it's got these histidines on the end. Is that going to be a problem? It might be. It turns out that there's a protease that will cut off those nickels. I'm sorry, cut off those, those histidines on the end. So a protease, I can take this guy, I can cut it with a protease, 
And now the histidines attached to the nickel all come flying off, and I've got my protein completely pure, all right, and without any of the extra histidines on there. Make sense? Yes? Good question. So the question is, once I've cut these histidines off of my protein, how do I get rid of them, right? Well, it turns out it's fairly easy to separate them because the histidines are very small and my protein is very large. So I can use a variety of techniques. There's one called gel exclusion. Did Dr. McFadden talk about gel exclusion with you? Okay. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it does. I won't tell you how it does it. It's kind of a cool technique. But it separates large from small very easy. You just pour it in and the large comes through and the small sticks kind of like this thing did here. So it's very easy to separate the histidines from my pure protein. OK? Yeah? Could you just use nickel again? You actually could, to some extent, do that. But since the, the histidines are already bound to nickel, they're, they're not going to stick real well. But, but you could get rid of some of them that way. You're right. Good thinking. OK. That's uh, what we do. So histidine tagging is extremely powerful. Uh, technique. I'm going to show you something here. I'm not going to show you how to do it, but I'll tell you what it is because you hear the, hear the term sometimes. It's called a library, all right? A DNA library, all right? Well, what is a library? A library, if you go to the library at OSU, you get books, you get magazines, you get videos, you get audios, you get information in a wide variety of, of, of formats, and you get all of the information that OSU has to offer at the library, all right? A DNA library provides all of the information of a given organism. So let's imagine, if you will, that I, had, I wanted to make a library of my DNA. It would actually be fairly easy to do that. I could take some of my cells, bust them open, I'd get the DNA out of them. I could cut them with a restriction enzyme. I could cut a vector or, a, or just a regular plasmid with a restriction in, the same restriction enzyme and ligate them together. Each plasmid, if I set it up right, would have one of my fragments of my DNA. The sum of all of those plasmids with all of those fragments would have all of my DNA, and that would be my DNA library. If I took that whole mixture and I transformed it into bacteria, now the bacteria would have all of my DNA. And that collection of all the bacteria would indeed be called a library. Well, the beauty of that is once I've got it there, if I have a way of isolating and saying, hey, this is the one piece of my DNA that I want, and I know which bacterium has it, I'm not going to tell you how to do that because it's kind of complicated, but if I know which bacterium has the fragment that I'm after, I've just isolated a gene that I'm after. Maybe it's insulin. Maybe it's human growth hormone. Maybe it's balding gene. Who knows, right? We've got it figured out, right? I think we should really, I really think we should, in fact, isolate the balding gene. That would be a very, if there's one thing you got, I want you guys to work on, that would be it. OK, we want to kill the damn thing. All right. What else? cDNA. cDNA is worth understanding how it's made. Okay. What is cDNA? Well, cDNA, the C stands for complementary. Complementary. By the way, there are two ways to spell the word complementary. I always like to make students aware of this because I see scientists that don't know this. Right? If I'm complementary to you, meaning that I'm saying nice things about you, that's spelled C-O-M-P-L-I-M-E-N-T-A-R-Y. But there's another kind of complementary. One DNA strand is complementary to another DNA strand, right? They align with each other. One compensates for the other. That kind of complementary is C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T-A-R-Y. You might just have heard the next extra credit question on the exam. just might have heard that, OK? All right. 
Now, the C in cDNA stands for complementary. Right? It's a complement, but what's it a complement to? Well, it turns out it's a complement to a messenger RNA. A complement to a messenger RNA. Why would I be interested in a complement to a messenger RNA? Well, let's think about a eukaryotic cell. A messenger RNA started out with introns and exons and a bunch of stuff, and those introns got removed, right? If I have a complement to that, I've got something that already has the introns removed. The coding sequences have all been put together in an intact form. And I could take that complementary DNA and put it into a bacterium, and it could make my protein because it wouldn't have any of those introns in there. It would be very easy for me to do that. So making cDNA of eukaryotic genes turns out to be really, really useful. And it turns out it's actually easy to make, too. Relatively easy. Why is it easy to make? Well, let's think about a messenger RNA. Messenger RNA had something different at the 5' prime end, and it had something different at the 3' prime end. Everybody remember that? I see some heads nodding, yes. Which means get on with it, Ahern. All right? Yes. All right? At the 3' prime end, we had something called a poly A sequence, right? If I were to take and isolate all of the RNA from a cell, I would get ribosomal RNA, I would get messenger RNA, I would get transfer RNA, and I would get small nuclear RNAs, right? I'd get all these RNAs. Let's say I wanted to make a copy of every gene that that cell was making. Well, the genes are going to be in the mRNAs, and only the mRNAs are going to have a poly A tail. What if I were to make a short nucleotide sequence that was T, 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 T. And I mixed it with the RNAs. What do you suppose is going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is all of the messenger RNAs are going to pair with that T, 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 with the A, 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 right? And the T, 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 T now becomes a primer for synthesizing DNA. I've just specifically said which RNAs are going to be replicated, because remember, it takes a primer to replicate. And they're going to be the messenger RNAs. Okay. And I'm going to need to use a special enzyme to make my DNA. What's the special enzyme I'm going to need to make? Use. It's Friday afternoon. What's that? Yes. Reverse transcriptase, because I'm going to be copying an RNA and making a DNA. So now I've done this in this mixture of all the genes. I've just now made a DNA copy of every gene that that organism was making. I've just made a cDNA library. In the first case, I made a DNA library, meaning I had everything. But now I've made a very specific library. I've made a cDNA library that is only the things that were complementary to the messenger RNAs that that cell was making. All right? A cDNA library is really, really useful. Once I find the gene in that mixture of the things that I want, and yes, I would transform, I put this into a plasmid, and yes, I would transform this into bacteria. But the beauty now is I've got the gene all ready to start making the protein that I want. I don't have to worry about getting rid of the introns or any of that. They've already been removed from this. Pretty cool. OK. Now, I'm going to remind you of that in a minute when I show you something called a microarray. Because microarrays are really amazingly cool. Questions about what I just told you? OK. Um, before I come down to microarrays, which are down here, I need to uh, bring up a couple of things, and then we'll go to that. All right? How many people have heard of PCR? 
How many people have done PCR? Okay. How many of you feel like you understand PCR? Smaller number. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not going to flunk you because you, you don't know PC. I will flunk you, of course, if you don't know it after I tell you about it. But you know, before I tell you about it, I can't expect that you're going to know it. All right. PCR is a remarkable technique called the polymerase chain reaction. It uh, has revolutionized molecular biology. Okay. Absolutely rec revolutionized molecular biology. Because of PCR, we have the ability to sequence genomes very, very easily. All right? Before PCR, people had no idea how they would determine the sequence of a genome, all right? how we would do DNA fingerprinting, how we would amplify DNA, how we would take tiny trace quantities of a DNA and make zillions of amounts of it. PCR enables us to do that. Okay? PCR was invented by a jerk named uh, Kerry Mullis. He was kind of a jerk. That's what some people say. Everybody's laughing now. I get your attention, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, PCR was invented by a man named Kerry Mullis. And Kerry uh, was driving home one night uh, from his work in a biotech company in Southern California and thinking about DNA replication. And it occurred to him that in DNA replication, one DNA becomes two, and two DNAs become four, and four DNAs become eight, and eight DNAs become 16. All right? Every time that replication proceeds, you double the amount of DNA that's there. All right? If you double something 30 consecutive times, you start out with one, and you end up with over a billion in 30 replications. That's what doubling does for you. And he thought that if he could harness that doubling, he could do what I just told you that you could do which is that he could take a tiny amount of something and make tons of it very easily. So what he did was he stole the idea of DNA replication. He took it out of a cell and he put it into a test tube. All right? And his idea was as follows. Okay? In, a, in a cell, DNA replication requires an origin. And an origin is a specific place where DNA is replicated. But if I use origins in a test tube, then I'm going to make all of the DNAs replicated. And I only want to make specific ones. Let's say I want to amplify a specific gene for human growth hormone. OK? How would I make millions of copies of only that gene and not of all the other ones? Well, this is where his knowledge and his thoughts about priming DNA replication came into play. We all know that DNA replication, DNA polymerase, requires a primer in order to get started. So what did he do? He took the DNAs and says, OK, here's a duplex of DNA. Let's separate the strands, because I'm going to need to do that, and I'm not going to have a helicase to do it for me. I'm doing this outside of a cell, not inside of a cell. How do I separate the strands? I boil them. I put them in boiling water, and the strands will separate. All right. Then I need to prime it. But I don't want to put a, a primase in there, because a primase is only going to work at an origin. Let's put a primer in there that I define what it is. So instead of using an enzyme, he chemically synthesized a region of nucleic acid that was complementary to the place he wanted to amplify. Complementarity, if he does it right, when he tries to put the strands together, will only go in the places where they're complementary to each other. So he could target where he wanted that primer to go by simply picking the sequence that would be complementary to the thing he was interested in amplifying. There's two strands. There's two primers, one at the top of the gene, one at the bottom of the gene. All right, now he's got a primer. Now he's got everything ready to go. What does he need to add? He needs to add a DNA polymerase, and he needs to add four DNTPs. DATP, DGTP, DCTP, and DTTP. Okay. When he does that, okay, replication proceeds. And replication proceeds to where I had two strands, I now have four. And the only things I've replicated are those between the primers. 
I haven't replicated all these other DNAs that don't have a primer site on them because they're not complementary to it. I take and I say, OK, I've got my four. Let's boil it. And let's let the primers come back in and form base pairs again. And we repeat the process. Each time, we double the number of strands we get, just like we doubled the amount of strands we got in DNA replication, but now in a cell. But now we're doing it in a test tube, and we're making only the thing that we want to make. Then he had a really cool idea. Turns out enzymes are pretty unstable in boiling water. When he did it each time, he would have to replace the DNA polymerase. And his question was, well, maybe I can find a DNA polymerase that doesn't go bad when you boil it. And it turns out there was one. There's many. There's a bac there are bacteria that live in boiling water in Yellowstone National Park, for example. There's an enzyme, there, there's, a, there's a, a, a bacterium called Thermus aquaticus. You don't need to know that. But Thermus aquaticus lives in that environment, and they looked at its DNA polymerase, and when they boiled it, it didn't fall apart. So now he had a perfect system. He didn't have to add, add enzyme each time he did it. He just simply had to boil it, cool it down. That allows the primers to come back on, allow the DNA polymerase to do its thing, and then boil it again, over and over and over. He does that 30 times. He starts with one DNA molecule. He ends up with over a billion. Remarkable. Okay. That revolutionized molecular biology. Prior to that time, nobody had any idea about how to amplify things. That was a remarkable thing. Okay. okay. Questions about that? Yes? How does he get replication to stop? Okay. Well, it turns out that replication will go past that priming site. But when the, that new strand gets replicated, it gets replicated starting from the complement, which is right there. So in other words, the primers ultimately define the stopping points as well. Okay? The primers ultimately define the stopping points so that you only amplify between the, the primers. OK. PCR, wonderful, wonderful, incredible technology. OK. I'm going to leave that be. I'm going to leave that be. I'm going to talk about microarrays, because I think that's, that, that's the next thing. Okay. I show you this, and you look at this, and you say, OK, so what? Looks like Star Wars, right? I've got to tell you what this tells us, because this is nothing short of remarkable. Let's imagine that we did what I said earlier with respect to making that cDNA library. Let's say that we made a copy of every gene that was in one of my liver cells. So my liver cells is making a bunch of messenger RNAs. And yes, my liver cells will probably be making different messenger RNAs than my skin cells will be because they have different needs. But let's say I take a liver cell and I make a cDNA library, that is, I make a copy of every single gene that my liver cell is making. Okay. Let's imagine that I um, put a, uh, I, I make it, I've got, so when I do this, I'm going to have thousands of such genes. And I take that mixture of thousands of such genes, okay, and I put onto it a, um, a uh, red dye. So now I've got every gene that I have has a red marker on it. Everybody with me? And let's say that I have another liver cell that is cancerous. And let's say I make a cDNA library of that cancerous liver cell. And in that cancerous liver cell, I isolate those cDNAs, and I label everyone green. I've got over here, this tube has got all my cDNAs, all my messenger RNAs being made in red. That's normal. I've got over here, I've got this group of genes that came from a cancer cell, and they're all labeled green. Everybody with me? Two sets. Complete mi mixture of all the messenger RNAs. Some will be made a lot of, some will be made a little of. All right? But that's what I'm going to have. Now, 
Let's imagine that I then go, and since I know the sequence of every gene because I know the sequence of the human genome, I go to a laboratory and I say, I want to have you synthesize the complement to every human gene. And they can physically, chemically synthesize the complement to every human gene. Where there's an A, they would have a U. Where there's a C, they would have a G. Okay? So they take one batch of these that corresponds to gene number one. Maybe it's DNA polymerase. And they mark a grid on a plate so that gene number one is position A1. Okay? And gene number two is position A2. And gene number three is position A3. All the way over here to gene number 596 is position A596. And then I come down here, and gene number 597 is B1. Da, 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 da. Okay? So I get this grid, each spot specifically corresponding to one gene from my genome. You with me? So spot number one, I know what gene that is. Spot number two, I know what that gene is, OK? So where'd my pointer go? There it is, OK? Here's gene number one. You can't even see it. Gene number two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see this grid. On this grid, this is not exactly that, but on a grid, I could have every single one of my genes there. Now the cool part. I got this tube over here that's got red attached to every gene that my normal liver cell was making. And I've got this tube over here that has green attached to every gene my cancerous liver cell is making. I add them both to this plate and let complementary base pairs form. And then I wash off whatever doesn't stick. And I look in the microscope, and this is what I see. Now, as I look at this, I see some genes pop up in red. I could look at that and say, oh, that's a protease. But why is it only in red? It's only in red because only my normal cell was making it. And I look over here, and here's another gene. And it's only in green. That means only my cancer cell was making that one. And some of these are in yellow. And by the way, when you mix red and yellow, red and, and green, you get yellow. A yellow means it's being made in equal amounts in the two. And here is a very faint green, which means it's being made a little bit in a cancer cell, but it's not being made in a normal cell. And I could go through and I could evaluate every single gene as to whether it's being made the same in a cancer cell as a normal cell, more in a cancer cell than a normal cell, or less in a cancer cell than a normal cell. By looking at one grid of this, I have just completely understood this cancer. I know, compared to a normal cell, what's abnormal. That is remarkable. I could take them and do the same thing and say, OK, I've got this new drug. OK? Let's say I've decided we're going to test medical marijuana. Kind of a fun test, guys. All right, we're going to test some medical marijuana, right? What effect does medical marijuana have on my lung cells? Right? So I get this really cool experiment. I get one lung to get the stuff, and the other lung doesn't get it, right? I isolate, and then I ask the same question. Which is red, which is green, which is yellow, and which doesn't even appear at all? And I could tell, is there a difference in my gene expression corresponding to the treatment that I've given? I use medical marijuana as a silly example. It could be aspirin. It could be a cancer drug. It could be smoking. It could be anything that's different that I want to compare. It might be a liver, a liver cell compared to a bone cell. This technology allows me to do comparisons, not only of individual genes, but of every single gene that's in those cells. 
Microarrays are revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary, because of the information that we can get out of them. All right, so that's kind of a, a, a quick and dirty. Questions about how microarrays work? Could you explain it to me? No. No. Do you see why they're valuable? OK. Review that. Okay? And if you, if you don't understand those, come see me. Okay? Microarrays are pretty amazing. Pretty cool. All right. Well, that finishes what I wanted to say there. And um, I'm going to briefly start the next topic, which is where we really should be right here. Otherwise, I would just call it a day. But I'm going to briefly start this. I promise I'll just do it briefly, and then we'll move on. Okay? And that is, we'll call it a day, call it a week. All right. Brief introduction to viruses. Very brief introduction to viruses. Viruses, as I've said earlier in class, infect every cell on the face of the earth. No cells escape it. Okay? Viruses are generally fairly, excuse me, specific for certain types of cells. There are some viruses, like flu viruses, that cross species barriers, but that's not common. Most viruses don't cross species barriers. Okay? Viruses are pretty um, interesting things. All right? When we look at the structure of these things, they're remarkable. Okay? That looks like a, like a, a, a mine or something, doesn't it? Right? They have an armor associated with them, and that armor on the outside is a coating of protein that's protecting a nucleic acid on the inside. That nucleic acid can be DNA. That nucleic acid can be RNA, depending upon the virus. It can be a double-stranded DNA. It can be a single-stranded DNA. It can be a single-stranded RNA. And it can be a double-stranded RNA, depending on the virus. So the form of the nucleic acid can vary considerably. Okay? Some of them are really beautiful. Okay? This is a representation. That's not a real one. But it's a representation of the symmetry of the virus that's there. Okay? Viruses are generally symmetrical. Okay? They're generally symmetrical because the proteins that comprise them are fairly self-assembling, meaning they come and put themselves together. Imagine doing a puzzle, and a puzzle puts its own pieces together. That's like what the proteins in a virus are doing. And they're symmetrical because they're repeated over and over and over. The interlocking pieces are happening over and over and over. It's like having a puzzle that all the pieces basically have the same fit, right? That turns out to be really useful. All right. There are DNA viruses, and no, you don't need to memorize those. There are RNA viruses, which include the flu virus. Okay. All right. Um, and what I want to say uh, briefly about is their life cycle. Viruses replicate inside of, of target cells. Okay. They use at least some part of the cellular machinery. The machinery being replication machinery, transcription machinery, translation machinery. They may use all of those, some of those, okay? but all viruses will use at least part of some of those. Okay? Viruses work by infecting a cell, and that infection happens first through attachment and you saw some of those sticky out things on that very first one I showed you that looked like a landmine. Those sticky out things will usually be sticky to something on the surface of a cell. So they get to attach to the cell. And when they attach to the cell, they then will inject their nucleic acid into the cell. They attach, they inject, and then that nucleic acid is processed in some way. If it's an RNA, the first thing that happens is it might actually be translated, depending upon the nature of it. Okay. If it's a DNA, it may first be transcribed to make RNA. Okay. 
In either event, whether it starts as translation or it starts as transcription, or as we'll see in a minute, whether it starts as reverse transcription, the point is that the virus has to get proteins made inside of this cell. The virus has to get proteins made inside of the cell. So it's going to steal some of the machinery to make proteins, and it's going to make proteins that are specific for it that it needs. Okay? Now, those, again, it's going to vary from virus to virus. But at a very minimum, those proteins are going to include the coat that the virus is wrapped in. At a very minimum, it's going to include that. Almost all viruses will have something more than that. Then there has to be some sort of replication event to make many copies, whether it's DNA or RNA, of the uh, genetic material. And then, magically, this self-assembly occurs, where the viral protein coat comes together and encases the nucleic acid. Thousands of these get made. They ultimately burst the cell and go out and infect new cells. Okay? Extremely, extremely um, efficient. All right. The last thing I want to say about is how HIV works. Yes? So his question is, is there a symbiotic virus? We don't think of viruses as being symbiotic, but there are viruses that don't kill cells. Yes. OK. Uh, viruses uh, can, and HIV is a, is a prime example, viruses can get into a cell and basically reside there. Okay, so not all, not all viruses go in and kill cells. Okay. HIV works sort of this way. Reverse, re, uh, um, um, the uh, uh, retroviruses okay, don't directly kill cells. Right? They go in, they, get, they invade a cell, and they, they, they start out as RNA. The first step for them is actually converting the RNA into DNA. So they're going through reverse transcription Making DNA from RNA is the first step. And then, and this is why the virus is such a, such a terrible thing, it gets integrated into the host DNA. It's integrated. That means it's physically linked to the host chromosomes. And whenever the host chromosome replicates, the viral DNA is going to replicate. Well, that viral DNA has a promoter in it a strong promoter in it to make RNAs that correspond to this original thing that you had here, the cell is killing itself. The cell will ultimately ensure that it makes plenty of RNA copies for the rest of the uh, virus to be propagated. Okay? All right. Now, that's a quick and dirty. I'll say more about that next time. But I wanted to finish with a song. Okay? Let's do that. This is a topic we've covered a little bit already. It's called God Bless These Complexes. All information in cells' DNA just increases with pieces mixed and matched in the mRNAs, linking exons all together using SNRPs in complexes. God bless the spliceosomes and transcriptomes. God bless the spliceosomes and my genome. Your blueprint info is in DNA. Since you need it, proofread it. Or you'll mutate the mRNA. You can translate all the codons with the cell's genetic code. God bless the ribosomes. They translate code. God bless the ribosomes and proteome. See you on Monday.